Crush your enemies. They drew first blood, not me. See them driven before you? Oh, my user. And they hear the lamentation of the women. But I pity the fool. Glitter in the dark near the ten hours of gate. Phone home. They're here. I'm a real light sleeper, child. Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're rewatching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in chronological order, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today we're discussing Butterfly, released February 5th, 1982. It was written by John F. Goff and Matt Simber from an adaptation by Simber of a novel by James M. Cain, directed by Simber and released by Analysis Releasing. <laughs> Yeesh. That's never good. When it sounds like an LLC. Yeah, yeah, that's where I like my movies to come from. Yeah. Analysis. Yeah, <laughs> cost-benefit ratio pictures. <laughs> Perfect. In 1947, James M. Cain's novel, The Butterfly, was published. At the time, Cain's novels were often fast-tracked for feature film adaptations, but the film's highly controversial plot ruled it out of consideration for most major studios. Cain had presented the manuscript to his author sister, Genevieve Cain, for her thoughts, and she recommended burning the story and pretending it never existed. <laughs> but Kane's publisher, Alfred Knopf, was more supportive, admitting to enjoying the story himself, but warning Kane that critics will likely savage the novel. The reaction was about 50-50, offended and intrigued, but The Butterfly sold well and ultimately ranked second place amongst Kane's best-selling novels. And we'll talk about more of them later, but he does a lot of, like, noir pieces of this era, like, for example, The Postman Always Rings Twice, Double Indemnity, uh, Mildred Pierce, things like that. So for not, this to rank above those. two of those, he not, wrote those three. Yeah. Oh, he did write those yeah. three. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. In 1980, the long dormant film rights to The Butterfly were acquired for $100,000 and a profit percentage by executive producer Tino Barzi, personal manager of financier Meshalom Rickless, husband of actress Pia Zadora. Director Matt Simber and screenwriter John Goff worked together on a draft dropping the the from the title to just Butterfly. Despite a discouraging critical response, Butterfly scored a handful of nominations at the Golden Globes, Best Supporting for Orson Welles, Best Original Song for It's Wrong for Me to Love You, and its only win for Best New Star, actress Pia Zadora. And then they discarded this category in the wake of a subsequent bribery scandal. Oh no. Zadora's Golden Globe nomination and win sparked controversy when it became known that her husband, Meshalem Rickless, had essentially bribed the Hollywood foreign press to buy his wife a Golden Globe allegedly inviting voting members to lavish stays at the Las Vegas Riviera Hotel, which Rickless himself also owned and which had served as the production office for the film. So the entire cast and crew stayed here during the production. Her award was further tarnished with Razzies for Worst New Star and Worst <laughs> Actress for the same role. Additional Razzies were nominated for Director, Screenplay, Supporting Actor Orson Welles, Supporting Actress for Lois Nettleton, Score and Song, and another win for Worst Supporting Actor Ed McMahon. I don't think Lois Nettleton is fair or the music. Yeah. Actually, most of these aren't fair because I think Orson Welles is fine here. Like, I've definitely seen him worse and stuff. I yeah. Mean, honestly, like, everyone's fine in this movie, maybe except I think Pia Zadora Pia. has some problems. Well, yeah. that's what I was going to say. She's, but honestly, she's not the worst she, she, actress she, of no, the year. No, no, no. Not, not even close. Not yeah. even close. But I'm going to say she is the only thing that stands out to me in this movie as being not something that I might nominate. Yeah, and you have to remember that in this same category, she was nominated against Elizabeth McGovern, who we saw in Ragtime, and Howard E. Rollins Jr., who was also in in Ragtime with her. And both of them were great. Mm -hmm. yeah. Kathleen Turner is obviously yeah. amazing in Body Heat for, yeah. for a first performance. Yeah. And then the other two were Rachel Ward, who we liked um, in Sharky's Machine. Yeah. But technically, she had been in night school before Sharky's Machine. And Craig Wasson and Four Friends, who I don't really care for. But maybe he's still better than Pia Zadora. Maybe I would still put her at the bottom of this <laughs> list. How old is she in this? I don't know. I think over 20. Okay. Oh, and, and uh, we're going to come back to the dumbest IMDb trivia. Uh, we, we haven't done this in a while, <laughs> oh, but <no. laughs> Richard's nodding. He saw this already. Yeah. He knows exactly I what I'm about so to say. I was so excited when I saw this. And I was like, oh, Patrick's got to mention this. There's no way I'm not going to point this out. Someone thought it was necessary to go into the IMDb trivia <laughs> and include this gem of a comment. The name of the ore metal being mined in the mine was, and then in quotes, silver. <laughs> <laughs> like, what obscure metal for people to be mining for. What is wrong with you? 
The story where this film takes place is, in quotes, Arizona. (laughs) (laughs) What are you doing? Why did you go on IMDb and type that? I feel like the in the synopsis, Silvermine is in the synopsis. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's fun. I'm glad that someone did that. <laughs> we start on a wide shot of the Arizona-Nevada border in 1937. A girl we'll come to know as Katie, played by Pia Zadora, sits on the side of the road waiting for a car to thumb a ride from. The first shot starts in a fake steppy slow motion, which I already never like. It always bothers me that it's like, if you didn't get the shot in slow motion, don't use it. Or use it at the frame rate that you shot it at. A truck stops for her and the driver asks why anyone in their right mind would want to go to the abandoned mine in Good Springs. What's anybody want to go to Good Springs for anyway? That town's been near deserted ever since the mine closed and the Gillespie's moved their silver operation over to Kingman, Arizona. The driver tests the waters by tapping his hand on her knee and then moments later sliding it down her leg. He assures her he saved her life by finding her when he did, claiming that when the sun sets, the road is swarmed with rattlesnakes and she'd have died for sure. Start off with like, I think there's a, a title of it being 1937. 30, 37. Yeah. And so right off the bat, I feel really bothered by her outfit. Yeah, it, it, it seems does, 80s. It does not feel like it's from the 30s yeah. in any way to me. And I understand that she's supposed to be somewhat promiscuous and, and, and probably not dressed. Maybe she doesn't have a lot of clothes to choose from. Yeah, maybe not dressed as uh, you know, restrictively as, as, as some of the other women of the time, but it just doesn't feel like it's from the era, right. like stylistically. That stands out to me throughout the whole movie, all of the outfits that she wears. Um, and there was a specific credit in the opening title sequence for her costumes oh, like yeah. separately from everybody else. And it I'm was like, just something where her husband hooked her up with a uh, fashion designer and yeah, was like, the, I'm going like, to wear was whatever you say. Credit and it was supposed to be like, oh, these costumes were specific to her. And I'm like, yeah, but you forgot the era that you're designing them yeah. for. I also, and I know we're not really supposed to question uh, necessarily what happened before the beginning of a film. They expect you to just pick up where it is. But how did she get dropped off seven miles from the town that she's trying to get to Mm -hmm. in the middle of the desert. It's like literally seven miles further down the road, you could have taken me to where I was going. And if it were that close and I didn't see a car, I'd at least be walking toward it in case nobody showed up here. The driver buries his arm deeper and deeper into her lap and eventually agrees to take her the whole way to Good Springs, seven miles down the road, which is only four miles past his exit. He pulls over just before Good Springs and she starts undressing him in the cab. When he turns around to undo his pants, she jumps out the door and makes a run for it. But she also, as she's undressing him, drops his boots out the window. Mm -hmm. So that he can't catch up with her quickly? Well, I guess that's why she did it. But for me, I thought she was trying to steal his boots because the second she gets his boots off, that's when she bolts out the door. And I was like, oh, does she just want a new pair of shoes? And so (laughs) she took his shoes and ran because she is carrying shoes as she runs away. But they're just... Her shoes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She's running barefoot. Because she's more reasonable than the characters in Jurassic World. <laughs> I need to run. I can't wear these shoes for that. He screams after her that he hopes the Rattlers will catch her. Over the next hill, she spots the abandoned mine. We cut to some time later as another car rumbles up the road, driven by Stacy Keach as Jess Tyler. He spots the girl and is transfixed by her. Miss? Hello? Something you want? How can I tell till I know what you got? He tells her she came to the wrong place, but she knows his name. He concludes she's teasing him and walks away to milk a cow. Katie snags a ladle full of fresh milk, and when Jess warns her it's not cold, she claims to prefer it warm. I feel like in 1937, people know it doesn't come out cold, though. (laughs) Yeah. By now, he's determined that she's one of the Morgan clan, his ex-wife's family. She points out he wasn't always so dismissive of the Morgans. Bill Morgan was 14. You must have liked it. You married her. Maybe. He says he loved her once, and she corrects him again. You must have liked her more than once. You had two kids. She drags details of the past out of Jess against his will, but learns Belle Morgan left him for a man named Moke Blue. The way Belle tells it, Jess kicked her out. No. She left. With him. In the book, she's just on the porch when he gets home. That's how the story starts, is Mm. him coming home to her, which I think makes more sense. Jess claims to have washed all thoughts of Belle from his mind, but he does think of his daughters. They left with Belle when the mine closed, and because Jess was such a trustworthy employee, the owners, the Gillespies, left him in charge of guarding the place from scavengers. Katie essentially calls him a fool for not taking advantage of the place, and then switches back to her aggressive flirtations. Hey, 
Don't it get lonely out here? Or is just milking that cow good enough for you? You keep talking like that. Something just might happen to you. Not unless I want it to. He blames her Morgan blood for all the horny talk, and she finally admits to being his daughter, Katie. I'm your daughter, Katie. Jess does some quick math to confirm her claims. Hours later, they share a meal inside, and Katie shares that she and her sister, Janie, were put to work by their mother, Belle, entertaining minors at the boarding house of the new Kingman operation. So it's been 10 years, and he doesn't recognize her at that all? That seems weird, yeah. Mm-hmm. Has I mean, it been 10? I thought it was more than that. Maybe. It has to have been more, because she's 17, and she, and she was Belle was pregnant when they left. And she I, was the younger of yeah. the two sisters. Oh, okay. Well, I thought she said that the last time that she saw him, she was six. Oh, maybe she does say I something I feel like, like she that. says that, so I assume that they left when she was six, but... I think uh, the character's supposed to be 17, so yeah, 10 or 11 years then. Yeah, I just thought it was weird that I'm just like, if you've seen her when she's six, you, like, I feel like you could put two and two together and know that this is the But maybe living by child. yourself, you don't realize how much time has passed because you're not seeing people age that much. And maybe. so in his head, he's still thinking of them when they were children, when he thinks of them. Jess is disgusted to learn that his daughters were used this way, but Katie doesn't mind. It wasn't all bad. The miners was nice to us. We reminded them of their own kids. We called them Daddy Bob, Daddy George. Made them feel good, I guess. Not so lonely. Ugh. Ugh. Gross. Just Mm. further establishing the overwhelming themes of incest that the film is just saturated in. Janie has lately taken over the boarding house because Mama Belle is dying of some long-related illness. How embarrassing would that be that You work with a bunch of miners who are in the mines all day, and you're like, I'm dying of a lung disease. (laughs) Katie shares that she quit school to raise a child, but she left it with Janie to come here, possibly for keeps. I come to stay with you. She pitches it like she just wanted to protect him from loneliness, but it's such a loaded statement that he flatly refuses keeping her here. She gets all teary-eyed, and he promises to find her another place, any other place. She leans on their familial relationship like that's a reason to allow it, but he clearly doesn't trust himself with her here. If she were a stranger, I wouldn't expect so much resistance. He segments their living space with a blanket like the walls of Jericho, and it happened one night, but she insists on changing right up against the curtain and casting a crisp, nude silhouette on the barrier between them. Now he shifts his gaze to watch her through the gaps in the wall as she moves around her room naked. She opens the curtain in sheer sleeping clothes to thank him again for his hospitality. I guess she brought a change of clothes? These clearly She had a suitcase. Yeah, she had a suitcase, but... In the morning, he calls for her around the property to announce he's leaving for church and eventually finds her at the mouth of the mine. She seems convinced that the mine was closed prematurely and suggests that Jess do some digging, but Jess trusts the owner, Mr. Gillespie, to know whether it's worth the effort. Is there enough silver in there to make one, maybe two people rich? Yeah. Maybe. If they could get to it. What's to stop them? Me? Now let's go. I like that line from him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, I'm not going to let you do that. So let's get out of here. I'm kind of bothered by the fact that they try to set him up as this super moral person right. when in regards yeah. to stealing and his boss and the mine. But then instantly, like there's no transition for him in terms of this movie. And as soon as he finds out it's his, it's his daughter, he should be repulsed by the idea that he yeah. finds her attractive yeah. and i understand that when he met her he didn't understand he didn't know yeah. that but as soon as that like switch happened it should have been disgusting to him right and, but it never is and i think they're just hoping that you'll accept that this guy is that desperately lonely but even when it happened in like old boy i mean if that's sorry if that's a bit of a spoiler for some people that it's a situation where when he finds it out, he's immediately disgusted and horrified by it. Yeah. And yeah. he stays horrified by it well, forever. And I would have preferred, I guess I would have preferred it to be the sort of situation where, like, he was disgusted by it. And then maybe there was a turn as he, like, you know, falls more and more in love with her over the course of the film because of her advances. But that doesn't happen. No. And there's a lot of changes from the book happening here. And I think they're all or mostly for the worse. Yeah. Um, they, I think almost all the changes make him out to be more reprehensible than he is in the book. Mm-hmm. I would actually like to see the story retold the way it is in the book with a couple of the changes that the movie made, and I'll, I'll discuss those. Jess tries repeatedly to coax the girl to church with him, but she is clearly transfixed on this get-rich-quick fantasy. 
She thinks he's crazy for pretending to be satisfied with his meager shack in the middle of nowhere. But honestly, a home, food for life, all he has to do is make sure there's nobody in this place squatting on the mine. Seems like a pretty awesome gig. Yeah. Jess has concluded that she never gave a shit about a reunion, and she's here for the silver. He suggests that she inherited everything that she's got from her mom, and there's no fixing the bad in her now. Maybe you just are your mother's daughter. No! Yes, you were bad when you got yourself pregnant without being married. What I got from it was good. Little Danny. Katie goes on to claim that Danny's father is Wash Gillespie, and Danny's grandfather owns the claim Jess guards. She considers the silver within to be an overdue child support payment. Wash's parents wouldn't let him marry her because Morgan's and Tyler's are below Gillespie's on the food chain, but Jess still can't abide theft. Katie says she's done worse to provide for herself since as young as 12. Maybe that was bad, but the things I bought with that money was good. And I want more for me and for my baby. I want good things for us. And if that's bad, then I want to be bad. He grabs her roughly by the arm and drags her to his car. Outside the church, Jess spots Ed Lamey, a mine scavenger, and a friend of Moke Blues. The Reverend Rivers, played by Stuart Whitman, introduces Katie Tyler to the congregation. This film marks the fourth time we've seen Stuart Whitman in a church. Do you guys recall the three previous appearances of Stuart Whitman in a church? One of them was a Minnesota review of Guiana Cult of the Dam, so you won't know that one. So there's two more. One of them, he's a priest, and one of them, he's a film producer. The film producer is taking shelter from zombies. Oh, well, that's got to be Monster Club, right? That's correct. But he played a priest in a church who was having a crisis of faith, as every movie priest <laughs> is doing. There's a great shot of uh, Jesus' statue in the oh, church. Oh, is it the ninth configuration? No. Oh, no, I'm thinking of the, about the Jesus on the moon. Yeah. No, there's a Jesus statue in the church, and then there's a close-up on one of the hands of the Jesus statue. Oh, and it's bleeding? No, the hand jumps off of the statue and grabs him by the face. Is it the hand? <laughs> no, not the hand. The, other uh, one. the messenger of demonoid messenger of death. something. Death. death. Yeah. Demonoid messenger of death. <laughs> Reverend Rivers tells the story of the prodigal son, and Katie feels understandably called out by it. But by the end, she thinks Jess should be learning a lesson about how to welcome her back. Rivers makes it even more personal by walking right up to Katie, calling her out by name and assuring her that accepting Jesus' name will wash away all her putrid sins, and she's embarrassed and frightened enough by this confrontation to run straight out of the building. I think I would, too. Yeah, anybody like, would. Like, there's one thing to give a sermon, but then just to walk up to you and say, you did this. You're the one I'm talking about. You're gross. Jess follows her away, and Reverend Rivers follows them, too, insisting that he was trying to help her, but she requests future help be offered in the form of cash. She walks away down the road, and Rivers accuses her of resembling Belle. Jess asks for more time to change her mind. Unless I'm misunderstanding this moment, it seems Rivers has already picked up on the sexual tension between father and daughter, which wasn't even really on display in this scene. You can only be a daddy to a Jess. Nothing more. Rivers invites Jess back inside, but he opts to follow Katie home instead. He stays up all night waiting for her, and in the morning, another car drops her off. He has lots of questions about who that was and what they did last night, but she doesn't seem interested in discussing it. He doesn't want her to continue this behavior or to leave. He wants to provide for her so she doesn't gallivant with other men. He pulls the ace up his sleeve and offers the mine for silver to support her and baby Danny. She's relieved to hear him change his mind and asks for a kiss. He plants one on her forehead and then leaves to catch up on sleep. I feel like they also don't play up whether or not... And maybe it's intentional. Whether or not this, like his protestation is over his fatherly duties or his jealousy. Yeah, I, I feel like it does point more toward a jealousy of what these other men are doing. Because Yeah, but I feel like that I feel like they shouldn't have done it that way. That it should have been very fatherly and then progressed towards jealousy. Which is why it's weird that when she says, I, I've come to stay with you and he's like, No, get out. Live anywhere else, please. Yeah. It's like that already is a sign that it's like I don't trust myself with you. Yeah. That's the only reason that you would be kicking her out. Yeah. The next morning, they enter the mine together. Of course, she advises digging in the deepest, most dangerous sections of the mine, assuming that high risk equals high reward. She's disturbed by the sounds of passing rats, but Jess explains they're a good indicator of something terrible is about to happen down here. Always follow the rats. They come to a crossing in the shaft, and right away she mistakes a copper vein for gold. He shows her how to loosen chips from the wall and finds a bit of zinc. 
She suggests that they just blast it all apart with dynamite when she realizes how fun mining isn't. Yeah. He reminds her that sound carries in these mines and people will discover quickly what they're up to. They spend an entire day mining and that night she achingly falls into her bed. He coaxes her to a hot bath to avoid soiling her sheets with mine dust. She ignores the bathing robe he offers her and crosses the shack fully nude to sit in the bath. Is it going to be like this every day? Hurting all over and not a thing to show for it? Well, I didn't close that mine down because it had a lot of silver in it. She asks for a shoulder rub, and it's clear this is already a dangerous temptation for him. It starts innocent enough, but of course, the score pipes in with romantic undertones and his hands creep around her to cup her breasts in the mouth. She seems to want it, but he stops himself. What's wrong? It ain't right. It's good to me. Just ain't right. It's right if it's good. You're my daughter, Katie. I'm a woman, too. She pulls his hands down under the water, and after a moment, he pulls it back and walks away. We cut to the mines as they continue hammering away. Jess warns her that she's swinging very haphazardly, and she smashes her hand before loudly giving up on the mine altogether. Yeah, <laughs> this is like, it's like I thought it would just be... Yeah, there like, was just going to be gold all over the place. Yeah, exactly. I thought it would be more like Minecraft. Katie, you got to stop playing those computer games. It's 1937. You're going to get us in trouble with the time police. He tries to keep her from leaving by presenting a silver nugget he just loosed from the wall, and when she realizes silver looks green down here, which he insanely never told her, mm -hmm. she points to a whole pile of silver chips that she's broken loose today. He tells her this pile alone is worth about $100, which is over 2000 today. We'll learn later it's actually over $200, so 4000 today. He tells her they'll take it to town soon, and she screams about how rich they'll soon be. We see the mine scavenger, Ed Lamy, hiding in the shadows and laughing to himself. Do you guys recall the last time a man and woman discovered silver in a mine together without the help of a full crew? Were they looking for it to begin with? No. The woman was looking for the man, and she accidentally leaned on a wall and fell into a cavern full of silver. Oh, was it the monsters in the cave thing? The Boogans? The Boogans? No. Was it the Boogans? That had a cave. I think that was a silver mine, too. Um, was it uh, My they're Bloody in, Valentine? No. They're in Guanajuato, <laughs> Mexico. She's coming to visit her husband after years apart. Killer hand movie. Oh, um, the... Messenger of Death one? Yes, uh, Demon, uh, Demonoid. Demonoid Messenger of yeah. Death. <laughs> because in the same room they find, it's pre-mined silver, and they also find people whose hands have been cut off in that oh. room. And then all the other workers that usually work the mine were like, we're never going back in there. On the way to selling the ore, Katie hops out of the truck outside a dress shop to splurge and advises Jess to do the same. When he returns to the store later looking snazzy in a new suit, the sales girl tells him the price of Katie's dress and points him across the street to the White Horse Cafe to find her. So this is where, every, this is like the stupidest thing you can do. You're supposed to be guarding the mine and not stealing. Spend a bunch of money in the yeah. neighboring town yeah. and tell everyone this is your daughter. Yeah, it's just like you just start, like all of a sudden you start wearing like fancy suits and yeah. coming in. Everyone's got to know who he is because yeah. he has yeah. to come into town for supplies. It's like, did your daughter bring a bunch of gold over from yeah. Kingman? Why do you? Why are you rolling in it suddenly? Or, or even more, when he goes to turn in the silver, it's right. like, where'd you get all this raw silver? Yeah, I thought he was going to take her like a few towns over to trade it in somewhere unsuspiciously, but he goes yeah. right to the town where everybody knows him. Yeah, or or melt it down yourself, or or do something like. Yeah. I mean, don't just take in raw silver, freshly mined ore. Yeah. It's like, where'd you get this? Oh, no reason. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Inside the cafe, he finds Katie mildly intoxicated and dancing with a man. He tells her their silver pile amounted to $210. Again, something I wouldn't shout out in yeah. a bar. Yeah. <laughs> she repeats it as loudly as she can. It's like, we're going to get beaten up and robbed here. She demands a celebratory drink. He suggests celebrating at home where drinks are cheaper and he doesn't have to compete with other men for her attention. She tells Jess to just hang out and drink more so she can take this man she just met for a ride. Jess tells her they're leaving now and the cowboys try to stop him when a fight ensues. He urges Katie to get out to the truck, and the bartender sends his wife for the sheriff, but when Katie joins the fight, she gets slammed to the floor. Jess loses his shit and starts smashing one of these men against the barroom wall and then knocks them both out. 
Do you guys recall the last time we saw a bar full of men push Stacy Keach too far? The ninth configuration? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> this is where I insert the Howie scream. <laughs> yeah! Like, they totally started it here, though. 100%, yeah. Like, the... the, the they They're are, shoving this old man around because they think that, they, why, that he'll just deal with it. I don't understand why why he would be in trouble at all for this. I'm well, surprised more of these patrons aren't stepping in to yeah, stop what's going on. But and but you know, and and the next scene when we get to the judge even says it's like, well, you know, it's a shit kicker place. Like, yeah, yeah. Jess collects Katie from the floor, and we cut right to a courthouse where a judge is hearing the case of the various assaults and property damage from the previous scene. Judge Roush. The man presiding over this case is played by the late, great Orson Welles. We establish the judge is a hard ass with a quick glimpse of the previous case, a cameo from Peter Jason as a transient, arrested for sleeping on a bed in a furniture store, and charged all the cash on him, and then given 16 days in jail to catch up on his sleep. Judge Roush is clearly enamored by Katie's appearance and also seems to hold a low opinion of the White Horse Cafe, dismissing the property damage charges almost immediately. He recognizes Jess as a local and a churchgoer, and asks how much cash Jess is carrying. When he claims $12, the judge takes it all again. I was worried he was going to say, like, 210 yeah. Yeah, Well, I yeah. mean, obviously he spent some of it, but, yeah. like, is 12 all he has left? No, he definitely has more, but he knows he just saw what this judge did yeah. to the last guy. So he's like, I'm not going to say $2, but I'm going to I'm not going to say the full amount. And, and to make it seem more legitimate, the judge even, like, itemizes, like, oh, this is for processing, this is for this, this is for that. He asks Katie's age, 17, and what she was drinking. She claims it was just soda, but the men have been known to add a little something extra to her drink orders from time to time. He orders her to the bench right up next to him for the performance of an old-fashioned breathalyzer test. She exhales as seductively as she can manage into the old man's face, and the judge short circuits for a moment. <laughs> like, he seems <laughs> unconscious, and even, like, the, the courtroom stenographer is like, back up, <laughs> give him some room. <laughs> But but this could also just be Orson Welles. Yeah, that, that's entirely yeah. It's like he just found a pea in his beard. <laughs> now they're even better raw. <laughs> what? That's from the critic. Orson Welles is in commercials for rosebud peas. Oh. Yes, rosebud frozen peas, full of country goodness and green penis. Wait, that's terrible. I quit. Just a handful for the road. I think it's a parody of that wine commercial that he did right. where he's super drunk on set. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever seen that video? Mm-mm. We'll watch it after. It's great. When he comes to his senses, the judge threatens to send her to a reform school if something like this happens again. Do you guys recall the last time a judge sent a girl to a reform school as punishment? A zutsu. That's right. The judge reminds Jess as her father to discipline the child and excuses them both. They giggle excitedly all the way to the car about the mere $12 that this bar fight will cost them. <laughs> it's a good thing you didn't tell that judge how much money we really had. <laughs> this is one of those razzy earning lines, the delivery of it. <laughs> mm-hmm. It definitely sounds 80 yard anyway. On the ride home, Katie sticks her head out the window to feel the breeze in her hair, and I started to get a feeling they were going to have an accident. You guys recall <laughs> the last time we saw people driving a car from the 20s after a preferable court ruling in a James M. Cain adaptation? Hint, the girl did not survive the scene. The postman always drinks twice. That's correct. Jess asks if she's embarrassed to flirt with every man she meets, so she does it to him for the rest of the way home. When they get there, her sister Janie is waiting on the porch, and Jess seems oddly disturbed by the arrival of his grandson Danny. In the book, he's very happy to meet his grandson, because of course you would be. Yeah. (laughs) But here he's like... Ugh, and just walks past the kid into the house. Again, like this like this seems very odd to me. Yeah. Well, to me, it's just like a reminder of, oh, yeah, this girl that I'm hanging out with and falling has in love with. Has a baby with, and ha- is my daughter. Yeah, exactly. I feel like that was that's what was happening here. Yeah, but I, I feel like he would be better at hiding this because he seems pretty mature in other respects. I feel like he would be like at least, oh, well, let me hold him. Like yeah. at least pretend to be excited yeah. about it. Mm-hmm. That night, Jess seems annoyed to be sleeping alone while the sisters tend to baby Danny. By morning, Janie seems to sense that she's a third wheel here. When Jess helps burp the baby, he notices a red X near the boy's belly button, and Katie explains it's a birthmark. It's supposed to look like a butterfly, but it's a very small butterfly, so it just kind of looks like a cross on his chest. Hence the title. Janie breaks the news that she ran into the baby's father, and it seems the Gillespies have changed their tune on the wedding of Wash and Katie. Jess is less than excited by the news. 
Later, we see a fancy car speeding up to the house, and Wash, played by Edward Albert, waves excitedly to Katie as he pulls up to the place. Unexpectedly, she meets him at the car and informs Wash that she hasn't just been waiting for him to come back, and he'll have to prove his intentions to her. She gives him the opportunity to propose here and now, and he takes it. Wash holds Danny for the first time, and then promises just that he will provide for Katie the rest of her life. That night, everybody's hanging out on the porch when Ed Lamy's truck rattles up to the shack. Jess grabs his shotgun, prepared for a confrontation. Moke Blue, played by James Franciscus, approaches, unarmed. Jess orders the man away, but he's brought a surprise, the dying Belle Morgan, played by Lois Nettleton. Lamy and Moke walk her up to the porch. Moke keeps making jokes about how cute Jess looked holding his grandson. Belle's in rough shape and can barely walk unassisted, but the girls greet her with hugs, and she heads inside with them and the baby. Inside, Belle hassles Janie for not being more excited, but she's quiet and contemplative. She takes after her father as much as Katie takes after Belle. Another coughing fit strikes and Belle collapses to the ground. Oh God, she's bleeding again. Get her on the bed. Jess tries to attend to her and it seems like she's realizing he would have been taking better care of her this whole time. She has a secret to share, but she doesn't manage here. She asks to see her daughters. Jess is left outside with Moke and Lamy, who start talking silver and suggest there might still be money to make here. They advise Wash to put Jess in charge of reopening the place, since he's the silver expert. Wash is intrigued by the pitch, since silver has recently increased in value. After the girls, Belle asks to speak with Moke. He asks if she told Jess about them, but she admits she couldn't bring herself to mention it. She asks him to remove her shoes, and as he starts to, she slips a long needle out like it's some sort of low-pan double wedding up in this bitch. He throws her to the ground, and when they hear the commotion from outside, Jess races in to find her on the floor. Moke is bleeding from the arm and explains she tried to attack him, but won't say why. Now you get out of this house, or I will finish for her. We cut from his exit to Belle's funeral. Ed Lamy pulls up mid-ceremony with his family and stares smiling at Jess. So, did Moke kill her after this? He yeah. fought her off as she was stabbing him. Like, I know she was on her deathbed anyways. Yes. But, but he didn't stab her or he anything. Didn't fin- she, did he she died her from off? from him fighting her off. So the exertion yes. killed her. Yeah, it was it was Okay, because that wasn't clear. It seemed weird to me that if he killed her, like even though she was dying, like there should be Feels some like consequences. this would be a bigger deal, right? Yeah. In the book, he he never brings her back to the house. Hmm. He tells them that this happened, which I think actually doesn't make sense. Um because there's he he has no motivation to tell them right that she attacked me with a thing he could just say she died yeah the end like he doesn't have to show them that he got stabbed with something or that he was hurt so it makes more sense for that to happen here where there's some evidence of what happened to him otherwise he would never bring it up to these people we cut from his exit to bell's funeral ed lamy pulls up mid ceremony with his family and stares smiling at jess who correctly interprets this grin as an indication that moke blue is scavenging the mine while he's preoccupied with Belle's funeral. Moke is bagging up a lot of silver when Jess walks in on him with a shotgun. He suspects Jess is too big a chicken to shoot him. Unfortunately for Moke, he's chosen to do this grueling work shirtless, and Jesse spots a familiar butterfly birthmark, presumably an inherited trait. That mark. That's the same mark on little Danny's belly. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that mark. Uh, all the boys in the family got that mark in Naturally, Jess assumes that little Danny is actually Moke's son, a scheme to weasel mine ownership from the Gillespies, but Moke is driven to hysterical laughter by the suggestion. Jess has been pushed beyond his limit again and blasts Moke right in the butterfly. Yeah, there, there's also a, like a lot of lore of how this thing works. It's like, it's like, yeah, if it's like, a girl, then it doesn't show up. Yeah, yeah, it, sk- it skips the generation if it's a girl, and then it goes to the next boy. And it's like, how far back does this go? Yeah, yeah, we got that marking in our family. Only, only the men get it. If the baby's a girl, it, it skips, skips to the next boy. See, the women are carriers. Jess suggests that Belle knew Danny's lineage and tried to kill Moke to bury the secret, but Moke explains that the mark only shows on boys. He's not Danny's father, he's Katie's. Danny ain't your grandson, you psalm singing bastard. In place of any regret for killing this man, Jess is only ecstatic to learn that he can go fuck Katie guilt-free, even though the Bible doesn't exactly endorse murder either. Mm -hmm. 
But he has at least a legal precedent to have murdered this man. <laughs> Does he? He yeah. shot. Oh, because he's a he he's a scavenger. Stuff yeah. in the mine. Yeah. But he has just as much of a legal precedent to shoot himself right here. Yes, of course. <laughs> and Katie. Moke claims they weren't even sure about Katie's parentage until Danny bore the mark. Apparently, Belle attacked him because she thought he came to take the baby and not the mine. Instead of calling for help, Jess wraps up Moke and drags him to one of the more dangerous corners of the mine, with dust pouring out of the ceiling. And we do this bizarre dissolve to hours later where Moke just looks dead and gray on yeah. the ground. Yeah, I it's was like, confused like, what is this? That. You should have thrown him in a hole or something. Yeah, yeah I, I thought it was another body. Oh, like but, he's yeah. killed multiple people. Yeah, like like this doesn't look like him. Suddenly, yeah. Jess is a serial killer. Well, well, no, well, just like other people that he's killed scavenging, and instead of reporting, <laughs> okay, it, and he, he just puts them all in he here. He puts them all in it's there. Like Jason Robards, just digging holes Stack around his wall. Up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was expecting him to orchestrate a cave in or something, but he just leaves the body here, where someone could find it in the future. And maybe that's the only reason why he doesn't throw him down a hole or something, because it's like we want people to worry about this mm-hmm. body getting found. But like you said, he would have a perfectly good excuse to be like, yeah, he was trying to steal. But the fact that he doesn't report it right away is doesn't look good. Yeah, yeah. Because if they found it later and he's like, oh, yeah, I killed him six months ago because he was trying to steal from the mine. It's like, why don't you say that when it happened? Why then? There wouldn't be anything left. Yeah. Because of those rats. Sometime later, Jess goes to meet with the Gillespies at a nearby hotel. Ed McMahon, as Mr. Gillespie, offers a firm handshake and welcomes him to the family as their children are engaged to be married. Jess is also introduced to June Lockhart as Mrs. Gillespie for the first time. What a strange appearance. Yeah, one scene cameo for each yeah, of these two. Yeah, for, well, the fact that Ed McMahon, for one, yeah. and then June Lockhart is like, why Why did you agree to this? I mean, maybe Ed McMahon was shooting that werewolf movie in Los Angeles, and he's mm. like, I can hop over to Arizona for a one-day thing. Mr. Gillespie is hell-bent on ignoring the past and deciding on a future for their children together. Jess takes this opportunity to sabotage Katie's future with Wash by claiming that the baby isn't Wash's. It's Moke Blue's baby. Unclear his strategy at this point because Katie will surely hear why Wash and the Gillespies walked away from the engagement, and she is well aware that the baby isn't Moke's because she remembers not having sex with Moke, I assume. I mean, I think that it would be easy enough for him to explain his conclusion as Mm -hmm. to why that happened. Maybe. But I don't feel like he makes any effort to to set that up for himself. Here's another question I have. Has Katie never seen Moak shirtless? Why doesn't she notice that her stepdad and her son have the same butterfly mark? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, Maybe she hasn't. It just seems strange. The Gillespies are only too happy to leave these wedding plans in the rear view and step out of what they considered a regrettable situation from the start. Jess advises never contacting Katie again, mostly to protect himself and the story that he's concocted. He heads back home to Katie, who's getting all gussied up for Wash to whisk her away to a new life, and Jess just stands there and lets her think that Wash stood her up. So this would be the most important way to, like, cover his tracks, because like I said, I think he can easily say, like, I saw this birthmark, I Mm -hmm. assumed Moke was the father, I told, I told, you know, your soon-to-be husband that... He shouldn't, he, right. you know, it's not his. Mm-hmm. And jumping ahead a little bit, that's the way it is in the book. When he tells Wash that the baby is Moke's, he still thinks that because it's before he's killed Moke and mm-hmm. found out the truth. Mm-hmm. So the whole point of it was he was trying to protect Wash, not trying to sabotage yeah. Katie's future with yeah. this man who would have provided for her her entire life. Which I feel like makes more sense. And But like not telling Katie that he spoke to the family right. mm-hmm. is like now that puts him in a position where he can't win. Yeah, because as soon as the word gets out that he came to them and said that and he sat here with you for your whole and wedding day and never said anything about it, Yeah, that's unforgivable. Like you have no excuse now. Jess and his daughters sit on the porch and stare out at the empty desert road for a car that will never come. Janie threatens to confront Wash about this, but Jess tells her that the man is a proven coward and there's no use dragging him back here. He and Katie conspire together to raid the mine for what she's owed. Jess claims the deepest corners of the mine must hold vast treasures, and he drags her there now to prove it. I thought he was going to show her Moke's body in the cave. (laughs) She falls on their way up the hill, and Jess's efforts to help her up evolve into a frenetic makeout session. When they worry that Janie might be watching, they relocate their activities into the cave. Again, Ed Lamy watches from the shadows as they fuck against the jagged cave walls. Does not look comfortable in the slightest. 
Sometime later, Jess and Katie unload another payload of silver from the caves as a car pulls up. It's the sheriff. Let's get those inside. The sheriff steps out of the car and Ed Lamy climbs out of the passenger side. Once Jess has explained away wandering down from the mine as a mere spot check, it becomes clear that the sheriff is here for other business. Which one of these girls is your daughter? Both. Why? He presents Jess and Katie with arrest warrants. What for? Incest. Jess and Katie look at each other shocked, and Janie, just horrified, wanders back into the mm -hmm. house to check on the screaming baby. We cut back to Judge Roush's courtroom. Ed Lamy is on the stand explaining that he loaned a gun to Moke Blue and came by the mine to look for it when he just happened to spot father and daughter fornicating near the mouth of the mine shaft. The prosecuting attorney makes a completely bonkers statement, suggesting there's nothing wrong or indecent about incestual fantasy until it's acted upon. It's like, who among us yeah. <laughs> hasn't harbored this fantasy? What? There's nothing wrong with that at all until you act on it. It's like, no, it's pretty fucked up already. The judge orders the defendants to their feet and informs them that if brought to a formal trial, their crimes amount to a sentence of 10 years each. To spare Katie, Jess offers a hypothetical that he raped the girl, in which case she is a victim and entitled to freedom, while his sentence is still 10 years. It doesn't change at all. That I'm guilty, and I forced her. Before he can be led away, she denies this confession, dooming herself. Do you have any idea what you just said? Yes, sir. He didn't do anything to me that I didn't want to happen. The courtroom is infested with scurrilous whispers. Jess has no choice now but to drop a truth bomb on everybody, and I'm honestly not sure why he was willing to spend 10 years in jail to keep this final secret. Yeah. yeah. Your Honor, she ain't done nothing wrong. Me neither. She's not my daughter. What? The crowd sounds almost disappointed by this twist in the story. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody puts their dicks away slowly. Like, ah, oh, damn it. <coughs> Just totally robbed my spank bank. He tells the judge that Katie's father is in fact Moke Blue, and she rejects this claim too. That's a lie. I've never known you to lie before, Jess, but I don't want to hear that, even if it is to protect me. No, Katie. It's true. And it's like, he just lied that he raped you, so you've heard him lie before. Mm -hmm. but, but also, okay, <laughs> So this seems like a weird turn on her part, too. But I, I guess she's just willing to confess whatever she thinks is the truth. Why does she want this not to be true? Like, it, like she's... I think the book explains it better. Okay. In the book, she is, like, blood-curdlingly disgusted by Moak Blue. The thought of him terrifies her. She can't be around him. She, doesn't, she cannot stand that man. And when... Uh, there's there's a scene where Jess suggests that they get married in advance. Like, so in the middle of the story, they actually do get married in the book. And he says that they'll just lie when they get married that Moke Blue is her dad. And she's like, you're going to have to pick somebody else. I'm not even going to pretend that he's my dad because that's fucking gross. And I fucking hate that guy. And don't even joke about that again. Well, that makes way more sense than it does here because right. I feel like this is an easy out for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, she should just go with it, especially because she just admitted to being a party to this and not right. being a victim yeah. and therefore just like yeah I, I did this on purpose but it's because he's not actually my dad sounds yeah. good let's go with that and she thinks that it's enough that it's like oh but we weren't acting like father and daughter when it happened it's like that's not that's, that's, not actually, that's, that's actually that's actually kind of the point yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the whole problem <laughs> you were not acting as father and daughter that is correct the prosecution tries to interject, but the judge is hooked on this rapidly unfolding telenovela. Your Honor. Uh, just a minute, Norton. This man's way out on a limb. I'm interested to see just where he's going to saw it off. I like that line from him. That's not in the book either. The judge calls Jess to the bench. He explains about the butterfly birthmarks shared betwixt Moke Blue and Baby Danny. But he has no way to prove it now. Yeah. Because yeah. he killed the only person yeah. that had the mark. The judge asks why, if he knew this whole time, did he hide that he was not the girl's father? Because she never really had a father. Not for ten years. And she needed that. But going to jail for ten years was going to help a lot? Yeah. It's like she wasn't going to have a father until you got out, if you even survived the ten years. It, it, would, be, it would be the first thing I would say to the sheriff as they were handing me, it was like, well, she's not technically my daughter. Yeah. 
Ed Lamy interrupts the sidebar to announce that Moke Blue couldn't be Katie's father because they're half-siblings and Moke tells him everything. Jess sees an opportunity to prove himself and takes it. He collects baby Danny from Janie in the audience. Your Honor? Oh, can't anybody stay put? I want you to look at this baby's belly. The baby's belly? I feel like this judge would be like, go fuck yourself. <laughs> what are you talking about? Explain this first before I bother where's Waldoing this baby's chest. Jess takes another risk, predicting that Moke's half-brother must have the same mark. But sure enough, when Jess forces the man to raise his shirt, it's the same mark. Yeah, and and, and uh, Lamy doesn't want to do it. Right. He's like, oh crap, this is going to blow the whole deal. He literally has to rip the guy's shirt off of him. Because he wants Jess to go to jail so he can get, get into yeah. the mine. Right, but they're only half-brothers and they share their mother. So that means that it skipped that mother generation from the father. That's how he knows that it skips mm. the mother generation. Yeah. Again, it's a very complex yeah. birthmark lore. I feel like they could have left all of that out and just been like, they all ha- birthmarks run in my family. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's all you need to know. <laughs> Yeah, because there's no reason she couldn't have had it. It it would make sense that she would have it and the baby would have it Mm -hmm. and that she wouldn't notice that her stepfather had it. Yeah. Ed finally admits that he's known all along that Moke was the father and they kept the secret together in the hopes they could leverage that knowledge for access to the Good Spring Silver Mine. The judge dismisses the case (laughs) outright immediately. Yeah. And a new trial has begun to address Katie's attempted incest. No, that doesn't happen. (laughs) But she admitted that she was like, no, I tried. I was trying so hard to have incest. (laughs) Conspiracy to commit incest? (laughs) I think think that's how it works. We cut to Wash Gillespie waiting outside the courthouse, and Katie gets to him before Jess can stop her. She learns the truth, that Jess sent the Gillespies away, claiming Moke was Danny's father. She looks back at Jess with anger, but is somehow flattered by his intentions. I don't get this moment either. Yeah, this is weird. She hands the baby to its rightful father and walks back to Jess. You don't love him. Not the same way I love you. She knows Wash can provide best for Danny, so she'll stay with him regardless of her feelings. I don't want to lose you. Jess, you'll never lose me. You're my daddy. And you'll always be my daddy. Always. Yes. Yeah. Uh, super uh, gross especially when she discussed how her daddies are all just men that she was forced right. to sleep with she's with, been doing this role yeah. play her entire life basically katie janie and danny ride off with wash forever jess hops back in his jalopy and rolls back to the mine and the credits roll over a sepia tone freeze frame of his car leaving town here's where we get the original song it's wrong for me to love you playing over the credits with music by ennio morricone Lyrics by Carol Connors and sung by actress Pia Zadora herself. Changes from the book. The novel takes place in the eastern U.S. and specifically Virginian Appalachia. I guess that makes more sense. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It's not really uh, an Arizona, California thing. (laughs) Jess quickly welcomes Katie to live with him when he learns that she's his daughter. He's a farmer. He doesn't officially work for the family of this mine that he lives next to. But uh, he does kind of unofficially guard it for the people but he's he's not actually employed by them he works as a farmer here in the book katie also quits school to have her baby but she wasn't a student she had already graduated top of her class and was working as a teacher when they forced her to quit huh. kind of like pennies from heaven when they found out she was pregnant they were like you don't work here anymore instead of dancing and drinking with the white horse cowboys she takes a job waitressing at the place instead of digging silver out of the abandoned mine Katie talks him into fermenting whiskey in the mine, which she's like, oh, you have all this corn. You could be making whiskey and it would sell a lot better than you're selling the corn for right now. And he's like, well, that's illegal and I don't do things that are illegal. But she eventually gets him to start making whiskey in the mine. But at that point, it's just it's just breaking a law on the books. It's not actually stealing a product from the right, employer. Right. Was this during Prohibition? Yes. Okay. Moke doesn't bring Belle to the shack, just news that she died. And then needlessly confesses that she attacked him and that he threw her to the ground and she died from the exertion of their fight. Jess isn't lying when he tells Wash that Moke is the father. He's just wrong. And I think lying to Wash about the child's parentage and sending him away is the worst thing he does in the film. Yeah. Like, (laughs) maybe maybe there's arguments could be made for some other things that he does in the film before he knows the whole truth. Right. But the fact that he does this is the meanest thing that he does in the whole story. 
petty even. Yeah, I really wish he was just – yeah, I wish the storyline was that he just got it wrong and then figured it out after the fact. Right. And then the other thing that I think works better in the book than in the movie the, – the only thing I like from the movie is that they were like, he's going to bring Belle to the house and her death is going to happen there so that there's more question about it and more evidence of what actually happened. And also we see it happen instead of just taking Moke's word for it like in the book. But at the end of the story – he gets back to the mine and Ed Lamy and a bunch more of the blue family are like surrounding the place. And the book is being written from Jess's perspective as a diary. And he's writing about how they're all outside the place and they're going to kill him because they found out what he did to Moke Blue. So the baby is washes. Yes. Okay. That's the other weird thing in the book is that when the Gillespie's and Wash leave, he takes the baby. Yeah. He takes the baby with him, and Katie isn't like, he stole my baby, we got to get him back. She's like, he took Danny, so I guess uh, we're just going to have to find a way to live together. Mm. It's like, you don't care at all? <laughs> you don't care that he took your child? What is going on? This doesn't fit the character at all. But uh, but that's not the way it goes in the movie. So that's a fix there. I feel like they go back and forth on how maternal she is yeah. in this movie a lot. But, I, I yeah, the fact that she was like, and and we never really hear a number for how long she expects Janie to take care of her baby while she's out here living with who she thinks is her father. I, and I think Janie actually is his daughter. Yeah, I think so yes. too. Because she's the older sister and that was before mm. she started gallivanting with He's not with sexually Moke attracted to her. <laughs> is that how it works? You're just automatically sexually attracted? So you don't even need a pregnancy test. You just go, which daughter do I think is hot? Yeah. Not mine. <laughs> That's a weird, weird rule. It's got a, a dowsing rod. Is that what they're calling it these days? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's uh, that's Butterfly. Um, people didn't really care for this movie. It has a very bad reputation. I honestly think it's not terrible. It's okay. It's fine. It's fine. I, I don't think Pia Zadora is great in it, but she doesn't totally fuck it up either. No. It it's... just feels like a typical like neo-noir uh, sort of you know, old school mystery. Yeah. I mean, I think that there are quite a few story points and like the way they approach Jess's story arc that could have made this movie a lot better. Yeah. Um, and I think a different actress would have made this movie a lot better, but it's But fine. the movie wouldn't have happened without this actress. Yeah. So, so it, it makes sense a little bit. Why would they be? Okay. Of all the vehicles to like want to put your wife in mm -hmm. why would you pick the incesty one i i think there's a <laughs> pretty good reason for yep. that i mean he was like 40 years older than her also okay so he he's just a pervert he wanted to be the daddy it, it gets worse oh no <laughs> we'll we'll discuss uh, another fun detail later <sighs> but uh what are we thinking thumbs on this I'm giving it a thumbs up, honestly. I mean, I think it's I'm fine. giving it a thumbs up because, like I said, it's a fine movie. There's nothing really wrong with it. It's not a it's not a subject matter that, you know, I'm just like, I love this. And as disgusting <laughs> as the implications are, I feel like the nudity is actually pretty, like, surprisingly tasteful considering the story. It's it's fine. I'm going to give it a thumbs up. Yeah. I'll give it a thumbs down. There you go. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be the voice of dissent here. Um, <laughs> and what are we thinking uh, letterboxed-wise for this one? Um, you know, and I also think it's a pretty well-made movie. Like, it's aesthetically, it's a well-made movie. Yeah. And, you know, acting-wise, it's a well-done movie. So I I do have it in fifth place right now. It is below Eyes of a Stranger and above Jaws of Satan. That's out of 12 for, okay. this, for the season so far. Uh, I, ha I have it at eighth. Um, I have it below The Aftermath and above Butcher Baker. Um, I actually have it in third, which is right under Butcher Baker and right above Vice Squad out of 12. All right. Tell me how it gets worse. <laughs> the writer director here was Matt Simber. He was formerly Mr. Jane Mansfield, divorced less than a year before her untimely passing. After this, he directs Fake Out with a lot of the same cast and crew and later 56 episodes of the original Glow series. After Netflix's Glow reboot, Simber's son, Tony Simber, directed a couple episodes of something called the original Ladies of Wrestling, which looks like a documentary on the the original TV series. The writer here was James M. Kane, 
We saw his work adapted last for Bob Rafelson's Postman Always Rings Twice. His books have previously been adapted into Double Indemnity, Mildred Pierce, and The Postman Always Rings Twice in the mid-40s. The screenplay writer here was John F. Goff. He's credited as a truck driver in the cast. I think he might be that guy at the beginning that mm. picks her up in the desert. We've also seen him in bit parts for The Fog, Alligator, and Under the Rainbow. Later, he shows up in Breakin', Maniac Cop, They Live, and Tammy and the T-Rex. He has a handful of other writing credits, but the only one I recognized was the 1986 Night Stalker movie. The music here came from Ennio Morricone. I like the music. He's probably best known for his spaghetti western contributions, including the famous The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly theme. We've heard his work so far in Windows, The Island, and So Fine, and he's back later to score The Thing, White Dog, Once Upon a Time in America, The Untouchables, and more recently Hateful Eight, for which he was finally awarded his first and only Oscar for Best Original Score. Cinematographer here was Edouard van der Enden. Not much else I recognized. The editor was Theory J. Couturier. Theory. T-H-I-E-R-R-Y. Uh-huh. What the <laughs> fuck? Not Siri, Theory. <laughs> that was so creepy. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh, like, uh, Richard, did that come out of you? <laughs> yeah, I'm, 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 I'm practicing throwing my voice, apparently. You're pretty good. This is his only picture editing credit. He moved on to mostly sound and dialogue editing with multiple Emmys for his work on the X-Files. Another editor, Brent A. Schoenfeld. He later cuts Nightmare on Elm Street, The Dream Child, and Leatherface 3. Leather Leatherface 3? No, it's just Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3, Leatherface, right? I do not know the, the Texas Chainsaw. I'm pretty sure the third movie is just called Leatherface. Editor Stan Siegel was an assistant editor on Easy Rider. This is his last picture editing credit, and it's mostly sound editing from here also. Stacy Keach was Jess Tyler. He was Titus's dad on Titus. He was Mike Hammer on The Mike Hammer Show, Ed Pegram in Nebraska, and we've seen him so far as Colonel Kane in The Ninth Configuration, Frank James in The Long Riders, Sergeant Stadenko in Nice Dreams, and most recently as Pat Quid in Road Games. Pia Zadora played Katie. She appeared previously as a child in Santa Claus Conquers the Martians and then took an 18-year break from working. So that's the only reason I think she was over 20 because I think she at least had lines, so she had to be at least three, I would guess, in that other movie. Zadora and director Simber reunite the following year for Fake Out, 1983. Next season, we'll see her in The Lonely Lady, for which Zadora would win her second consecutive Razzie Award, becoming the first ever back-to-back -back winner in the category. Zadora's husband, Israeli billionaire Meshalam Rickless, was the founder of Carnival Cruise Lines and Glow, the gorgeous ladies of wrestling. He financed this film as a vanity project for his wife. Somewhat disturbingly, they have a daughter together named Katie Zadora as a reference to this film. Oh, what? What? Spelled Why? the same way, K-A-D-Y. That's weird. So I think I he like really, it. really liked this story in mm -hmm. particular and sought it out oh, to God. make with her. I do not like it. After this, she shows up as Dee Dee in Voyage of the Rock Aliens, a beatnik in Hairspray, herself in Troop Beverly Hills, and herself again in Naked Gun 33 and a third. Orson Welles played Judge Roush. He shot his whole part in a week. We mentioned him last for his narration work in History of the World Part 1. Orson is best known as the writer-director of 1941's Citizen Kane and later titles like The Magnificent Ambersons and Touch of Evil. He's Robin Masters, for whom Magnum P.I. is house-sitting on Magnum P.I. One of his final feature credits was as the voice of Unicron, the planet-eating Transformer, in 1986's Transformers the Movie. We also saw him as General Dreedel in Catch-22. Lois Nettleton played Belle Morgan. We've seen her in Dirty Dingus McGee and Deadly Blessing. She's also occasionally the voice of Maleficent in various peripheral Disney materials. Edward Albert played Wash Gillespie. This is his second butterfly credit after 1972's Butterflies Are Free. We've seen him so far in When Time Ran Out and Galaxy of Terror. He's also in Midway, and more recently he portrayed Mr. Collins, the father of Time Force Red Ranger Wes in Power Rangers Time Force. I think he's like a villain of the series, but then he redeems himself toward mm. the end. James Franciscus played Moak Blue. Before this, he shows up in The Valley of Guanji, Beneath the Planet of the Apes, The Cat of Nine Tales. We saw him last with Edward Albert in When Time Ran Out, and he's back later this season for The Last Shark. Stuart Whitman was Reverend Rivers. He was a sentry in The Day the Earth Stood Still. He's Griffin in Captain Apache. We've seen him so far in Night of the Lepus, Guiana Cult of the Damned, Demonoid Messenger of Death, and The Monster Club. Later he shows up in episodes of Knight Rider, Fantasy Island, Tales from the Dark Side, The A-Team, Murder, She Wrote, Briscoe County Jr., and Ah Real Monsters. 
June Lockhart played Mrs. Gillespie. She was Maureen Robinson in 84 episodes of Lost in Space, and she returned to play a principal in the 1998 reboot film. She shows up in Troll alongside daughter Anne Lockhart and in Chud 2, Bud the Chud. I love June Lockhart. Yeah. Uh, I think my biggest thing was uh, watching Lassie reruns. Oh, okay. She was the, the mom on Lassie. Yeah. Or one of the Lassie right. shows. Ed McMahon played Mr. Gillespie. Obviously, he was Johnny Carson's sidekick on The Tonight Show. He played himself in a lot of stuff, but he might best be known as a spokesperson for Publishers Clearinghouse. Turns out, though, that's actually a Mandela Effect thing. He was not affiliated with the Publishers Clearinghouse at all, but rather American Family Publishers, which was essentially the same thing. But for some reason, I always thought it was the other one. We saw him last in Full Moon High. Paul Hampton played Norton. He's better known for his music career, writing songs for Burt Bacharach, Sammy Davis Jr., Bette Midler, Tom Jones, Elvis, and Johnny Cash. He also wrote the theme song for My Mother the Car. George Buck Flower played Ed Lamey. We saw him as Tommy Wallace in The Fog and the fake president in Escape from New York. Later, he's a cook in Starman, a bum in Back to the Future, a security guard in Mac and Me, and a drifter in They Live. Anne Dane played Janie. This was her first feature film. Later, she appears in Chained Heat, The Stuff, and It's Alive 3. It's Alive, of course, being one of our current Patreon options, if you oh, haven't really? already voted. The first It's Alive is, is an option, not the one she was in. Peter Jason played Alan. That's the guy who slept in the furniture store. He also appears with Orson Welles in The Other Side of the Wind. We've seen him so far in The Baltimore Bullet, The Long Riders, Nice Dreams, and Mommy Dearest. Later, he shows up in 48 Hours, Angel, The Karate Kid, Brewster's Millions, They Live, Arachnophobia, In the Mouth of Madness, Congo, Mortal Kombat, Hail Caesar, and in the Deadwood movie as Con Stapleton. I think that's everything for Butterfly. If you have any thoughts you'd like to share, you can find all our socials at linktree slash vintage video pod. If you enjoy what we're doing, consider giving us a review on iTunes. I don't believe it helps our visibility, but it's good for morale. And if you really like the show, maybe you should join our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash vintage video podcast for access to all our monthly 70s reviews and a hand in choosing next month's film. Patrons are currently choosing between Caged Heat, The Conversation, Foxy Brown, The Golden Voyage of Sinbad, It's Alive, and Truck Turner for a 50th anniversary review next month. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing Night Crossing, which IMDb describes like so. The true tale about two men planning an escape from communist East Germany in a hot air balloon, but only if they can take their families with them. We leave you now with the trailer for Night Crossing. The East German border, 836 miles of barbed wire walls, armed guards, and landmines. On September 15th, 1979, two families tried to cross it. Emergency alert. The most daring escape attempt of our time. It would only take 28 minutes. And a miracle. Night crossing. Rated PG. Guys, guys. We've been doing this thing for a while, and uh, I think it's about time we make a trailer. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so here we go. Let's get this thing. All right, ready? All right, what's going on, everybody? We are Dissect That Film. I am Brett. I'm Dan. I'm Angela. And we... Oh, wait, wait, wait. Wait, guys. I have an even better idea. What if we had somebody with an epic voice sell our show in a way that our show actually isn't? What do you say? Yeah. Sounds perfect. All right, let's go. Let it rip. Your host... Parker, Dan, and Angela slice and dice their way through the good. If it bleeds, we can kill it. The bad. You brought the devil! <laughs> There's a devil inside our room. And the ugly movies you love. And you can't piss on hospitality! I won't allow it! Hold your favorite films and franchises tight, because they aren't safe. In fact, it's already too late. It's time to dissect that film. I, I wish our show is what, what what that guy just said, but you know what? If you want to listen to our awesome show, Dissect That Film, you can listen to us on YouTube and on your favorite podcast apps every single Friday where we talk about all the wonderful films, good, bad, or ugly, as uh, that uh, epic dude said back there. So until next time, I'm Brett. I'm Dan. I'm Angela. And we'll see you all again next time. We'll be right back.